Hello and welcome to the Animation Communication Podcast, your source for discussion about animation, film, fandom, and more. So please, join your host, I Love Kim Possible A Lot, or KP, and Lauren Kizich, the Abbey Roadie, for today's discussion. If you like what you hear, please remember to support by giving a like, a follow, as well as subscribing to the main I Love Kim Possible A Lot channel on YouTube. Spread the word, and keep being a part of a great community. This episode is appropriate for all ages. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Animation Communications. I'm Lauren, a.k.a. The Abbey Roadie, and with me is KP, as you all know her. Guess what? We switched roles today. Isn't that exciting? Now she is the dom. Do do do. And roles are switched back. <laughs> <laughs> There can only be one. <laughs> We're just going to have a battle to the death over who's going to be the lead MC at this point. <laughs> we'll have like one of those DJ death battles or whatever the kids are doing these days. <sighs> Epic host battles of history. Woo. Yeah. I mean, Lauren and I are like ridiculously close in age anyway, so it wouldn't matter too much. But um, anyway. Um, so this episode is going to be talking about just some basic art principle stuff, um, just things you should learn as a general artist on the internet or outside the internet. Um, Lauren has an animation degree, right? Yes, I do. Animation, I have a bachelor's in animation and a minor in studio arts. Okay, and I have a, my fancy degree, my bachelor's degree is in film, um, which is, it's kind of, eh, it's okay, I don't. If you're going to go to film school, go to a school that actually has, like, film equipment <laughs> is my suggestion. Or else you're just going to be doing a bunch of analysis. And I'm just like, this is what I do on the internet anyway. Thanks, thanks, you know, school, state school that I won't name. And then um, my minor is in studio art. So I've taken a lot of life drawing classes and 3D design and 2D design and in color theory so if you don't know what any of those are we will get to that in the end of the podcast so i promise i'm just not someone who's just like lauren tell them things i'm gonna read a magazine and you know <laughs> pretend i know things so we are we are equally like knowledge in these things professionally if that's what matters to you <laughs> anyway you're gonna sit down for this three-hour ted talk on how photoshop works anyway <laughs> that's that's the podcast it won't be three hours. I, I'm, I'm, I swear to God, it won't be three hours. <laughs> okay, before we get into any of the educational stuff, Lauren, um, what's in the news? <laughs> well, what's in the news? Um, well, let's see. Scoob came out yesterday. Yes, this kind of dates the episode a little bit, but Scoob did just come out. And a lot of people really liking it. Some people have their issues with it, but, you know, what movie doesn't? Um, but it, I personally have watched it, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, it's totally true to the actual vibe of the original cartoon series, at least to me, while still updating it for a more, I guess you could say, millennial crowd without it being too over the top. Like, sometimes you feel like you can't stomach the stuff if it's too overdone, but this one, it was done just right. Uh, had a new cast, you know, it wasn't with Matt Lillard or Great Lyle, but it did have Frank Welker back as, as Scooby-Doo, so that was good, and he actually got a sc- screen credit, so that was really nice, seeing his name up on, well, the, the home big screen, I guess you could say. <laughs> and, it's, um, it's the thought that counts. Yeah, and I know a lot of people were uh, hoping to see it in theaters, but they, yeah, Warner Brothers released it on VOD. Uh, on the day it was supposed to be theatrically released. So as far as this quarantine goes, uh, you know, we'll see where all these other uh, movie releases come in down the line. How many more are going to be just straight VOD? We'll see. We'll see. Um, But yeah, and then uh, we also have updates on a couple live action films. I believe we touched on one kind of recently and the, but the other one is brand new so hercules live action is uh, the live action adaptation is being done by disney and that's in the works right now and that's been you know getting like all the internet up in a tizzy about it which i mean it can be a good or a bad thing but either way people are excited one way or another about it to see what they'll do and i think they said they'll still stick to it being a musical we'll still i i think i think they're going to try to it better be a musical yeah and like 
Don't you, I, you lost me with Mulan. Don't don't deprive me of the muses, man. I know. It's it's especially when it was just like the music was so ingrained into the storyline of the original. And I mean, some people are going, "Oh, but wait, what if it's more like the actual Greek mythology?" I'm like, "You can still have music in it. it doesn't doesn't mean it can't." <laughs> and plus, people want to see like, when they're seeing Disney's Hercules, they're seeing their adaptation of Hercules. You know, that's what people kind of expect. If you, I know <laughs> it's just yeah. go go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, well, the other one that people are also mixed about but i see a lot more excitement about it is uh atlantis the lost empire is getting a live action adaptation as well uh that is one of the ones that and treasure planet i think are the two movies i said long ago that needed if they were to be done in live action those are the two movies i think deserve that kind of second chance in the movie theaters as much as i love the animated versions but we'll see how many more people want to see the live action versions because you know what it's almost we almost had atlantis submarines at disneyland because of the first movie so i mean just saying it was in the it was in the blueprints (laughs) didn't the movie like perform okay-ish though like i don't remember atlantis bombing as well as badly yeah it, it, it did okay i mean okay enough that disney was hopeful that they were going to turn one of their you know they were going to turn this the old uh submarine voyage at disneyland into an atlantis ride um still keeping the submarines of course um but they uh but yeah the movie only did okay so much as i mean the crew was getting ready to go back in to make the sequel and or no was it the sequel no yeah they were already making so i think they were already making the you know the made for tv kind of like they were making a pilot i guess yeah the yeah the pilot for the and, tv show that didn't get to yeah, be a I think, tv show yeah and that's pretty much as far <laughs> as they got with it now i'm realize i'm getting mixed up the tr- uh, treasure planet was the one where they were on their way to making a sequel had stuff ready and then they got word at, that after um initially after like the, the initial box office for treasure planet it bombed so bad that they said we're we're dumping everything and that left that whole crew just stranded <laughs> okay i'll 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 just do a little tidbit because i can do a whole podcast about treasure planet because <laughs> treasure planet is one of my um top movies of of all time for me not just animated but all top um, it's great. I love it. Go see Treasure Planet. But anyway, um, so the tidbit I think that is interesting is I actually talked to a Disney employee who's on the lot or just working on um, more on the technical side versus the animation side of Treasure Planet. Mm-hmm. And they talked about when it bombed and historically the advertisement and the marketing is what's to blame for it. Plus it got released in a weekend that had like the second Harry Potter and Mm -hmm. the second Lord of the Rings. And I think a James Bond movie all in that weekend. So like it didn't stand a chance, but um, Michael Eisner at the time, who's was the head of uh, Disney um, Mm -hmm. actually took responsibility and apologized to the whole crew for how he handled the marketing for the movie. So at least there's some accountability there, even though that's not very much a public knowledge thing, but I, you know, I feel like, you know, like we talked about earlier, the Horn King is in the, the Disney Sorcerer's app. So I'm, I'm just kind of hoping that as time goes on, it will be more kind to Treasure Planet as what's happening with Hunchback. People are remembering Hunchback more fondly as time goes on from what I've realized. And uh, Lauren, do you have another example off the top of your head? Um, well, I was going to say, I, I was initially was going to say, like, what happened to Treasure Planet is what happened to Iron Giant and Cats Don't Dance. You know, being released mm-hmm. in a, in, being released around the same time as another movie that took away its thunder. And also just even more so poor marketing, like really poor marketing. And it's all because at the time it was just almost like nobody believed in the projects being successes. So uh, now they're like cult classics, if not some of the more celebrated movies of the 90s. So go figure that one. Um, Did you ever, out of curiosity, did you ever see Titan A? Yes, I did. I remember... (laughs) The weird thing is, I remember watching it. Okay, story time. I remember watching it. I think it was on... uh, It was originally... I think I saw it being broadcast on... Well, what's now the CW. But back in the day when it was like... I guess it was like Warner Brothers... It was still like the Warner Brothers channel. It was just the WB. That's pretty much what it was called. 
and I remember it playing as like one of those like movie night kind of shows or, like on a weekend like I think it was probably like one of those matinee shows that they play at like 4 p.m. <laughs> and I had no idea what I was watching at first I, I watched it from the very beginning all the way to the end and I first thought huh this version of Treasure Planet is not the one I remember <laughs> That guy kind of looks like Dimitri, but he's blonde. <laughs> yeah, because it, cause, yeah, it's a Bluth production. So, I mean, yeah. So the characters ended up looking a lot like they were bootleg Anastasia characters. Sorry. It's like I'm not being in, I'm not insulting the project. It's just the Bluth style when you can tell the who, you know, who worked on the movie or whose hands were all over a project, especially when it comes to Don Bluth stuff because of the because of the way the people are drawn or the or the animals are drawn. Or it's just like there's something distinct in his style that you can tell. So when you're seeing <laughs> blonde Dimitri <laughs> and, and space Anastasia. <laughs> and space Nathan Lane. Yeah. Yep. And I, <laughs> I just remember it was just so dark and even just way darker than I thought. Yeah, I well, what I would have expected, especially because I thought, oh, am I watching another version of Treasure Planet? Little naive me, <laughs> seeing this movie at like what nine years old. <laughs> so it was, it, it, but I I remember loving it. It was just very very dark, and I think it's something one of those things I have to revisit now, because even though I watched it so many years ago there's a lot i still remember and it's especially because it was a more mature film yeah i'll i'll say so i i watched it like maybe two or three years ago just to mark it off my list of things i've seen um i didn't really like it that much i felt like the characters weren't really well developed um and the story was just kind of got stupid yeah. essentially because um the, the twist for very obvious stuff like that but visually it's very interesting it kind of reminds me of the the video game beyond good and evil as far as the visual style so it's it's like it's more like atlantis kind of style but in space versus like treasure planet space more like mm -hmm. pirates in space but like more 20th century industrial revolution space yeah so you know um it has a unique visual style that way, but it's not as, like, just juxtaposition-y, if that's a word, um, between Treasure Planet, which, again, you know, I love Treasure Planet. Go see Treasure Planet. It's on Disney+. Plus. Yes. But, um, yeah, so Tainé is kind of, like, if you want to see it, go see it. It's it's not it's not the best movie, but I guess it's interesting. But I appreciate I was, it for I what was... it tried to do. It's def it's far from a perfect movie, but it's like, hey, we can all we can all like like things, and it doesn't have to be perfect. Hey, the room is a mess, but we like it because <laughs> it's a mess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My thing is always like, if you like something and it's bad, realize the aspects that you like about it, and realize what can be approved upon. Like, you're not inherently stupid for liking a stupid movie. I think you yeah. just have to take apart. The points as far as and i think that's a just a big thing in internet culture and reviewing in general that you know there's the implication that you're stupid for liking this stupid episode or you're the stupid media or like i'll probably talk about it when it gets closer but space jam everyone like that's the only nostalgic property i think that i've seen a, re a resurgence of that i'm just like but do you but space jam like there's always this story that like um Mel Blanc, I think, went to a Space Jam party when he was, you know, older, obviously, and, mm -hmm. you know, tried to argue that, I think it was Mel Blanc, it was either Mel Blanc or one of the, um, one of the head animators for Bugs, and tried to argue that the Bugs depicted in Space Jam was out of character, and they just kind of laughed him off, and he left early. So, you know, it's... Yeah. I, I, there was a, I, I think whole, Space Jam... Go ahead. I was gonna say, that whole production was a mess for Space Jam. It was, and the problem is, is that the product was absolutely just 100%, 1 million percent, just a conglomerate commercial. It was all of these mm -hmm. different brands, all these different icons all coming together for one giant commercial within a commercial within a commercial that also had aliens so <laughs> playing basketball. So it was... Uh, yeah, it's... Yeah. And Bill Murray, for some reason. <laughs> not not complaining. Yeah, Bill Murray's just Not there. complaining, but Bill Murray... <laughs> Before Bill Murray got like super, super, super old, I'm, not tr I'm trying not to curse because this is an age-appropriate podcast because we'll talk about like basic stuff. But like, 
man, like, of all these nostalgic things, you want to um, redistribute so society Space Jam. Like, I don't want to see Space Jam shirts at Hot Topic and in Route 21. I want my Treasure Planet. Like, I shouldn't have to go on Etsy or Redbubble to buy Treasure Planet stuff. Disney? Okay. And, and spiel. <laughs> I was gonna say, did you want to bring up uh, any any other things that had happened in the in the more recent times in entertainment slash animation? Oh yeah, there was the one thing. Um, so She-Ra just ended um, the new the reboot for um, the '80s She-Ra that DreamWorks took over, and it's great, and I recommend it. Um, if of this recording, the internet is raving about it, so I know I, I knew I had to watch it quick before I was spoiled, and I was spoiled a little bit anyway, but like. Um, for those who have seen my she video, um, I kind of predicted what was going to happen anyway. Like, I could tell the beats that were going to happen, so, you know, whatever, I guess. But everyone's very excited about it. I'll try not to spoil it, but it's, you can probably guess what happened that I'm hinting at. Like, it's, you know, very, very, very inclusive gay pride, yay stuff, which I'm, I'm good, I'm good for. I, I applaud she Um... I'm not as satisfied with it as much as everyone else is. I think Catcher got off a little bit too easy. All the stuff that she kind of did pre-season 5, I think she had to face some more harsh consequences than, you know, just basically trying to save other people. But anyway, that's my only real complaint, and it got pretty mushy near the end, and I just bought myself a Netflix- or I sat into for the 30-day trial just so I could watch the whole thing. <laughs> because um, it was going to take too long to get on the alternative cartoon sites that I knew I just had to go wa watch it on Netflix. So I, that's what I did all yesterday, was watch the rest of She-Ra, and it's good. I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. I always say it's as good. It's on the levels of Avatar The Last Airbender as far as just, like, world building and storytelling and character development, and uh, my issues with it are nitpicky at the at the most i think um but yeah lauren have you seen much of she-ra in general uh i've only seen i've truthfully really only seen like clips here and there i mean I, the, the thing is with the internet everybody's going to be posting about everything so i pretty much know how everything is, ends <laughs> but it doesn't mean i won't watch it because i do love the animation and i do love the the characters that i have seen clips of so i mean it, and plus, I'm fam and I'm familiar more with like the OG Shira, so I'm like I'm totally mm -hmm. I totally want to see and really sit down and dive into uh, DreamWorks Shira. I should have I should have gotten into ult into Voltron, but I haven't gotten into that one yet either. I'm way behind on that. Yeah, I heard that ended kind of badly. <laughs> Oof. Yeah, I'm like, but yeah. there was there was a hardcore fan base for that at a t at one time, and I mean. I, I'm sure they're still out there. I just haven't seen as much Voltron content as of late because it's just I just remember how diehard the fandom was, though. Yeah. All I know about Voltron is that it ended very badly and there is some, um, some, some fight for control between the creative team and the executives depending on how much, like, hardship they wanted to d depict. Mm -hmm. I don't think She-Ra had as much of a problem because the... the the things that it's that it finalized near the end were things that were set up early on in the in the show. I mean, it's pretty obvious, like on hindsight, when you think about it. So I don't know, but you know, I, that's someone who hasn't seen Voltron. That's just something I've heard. Um, but yeah, I love Shira. I have the Adora jacket. I relate to Adora a lot. Um, and then I, if it actually happens, um, one of my conventions this year that got postponed is phoenix fan fusion i'm actually hosting the she panel there so hopefully come out to that if you're in phoenix arizona assuming that the con is still happening in september or whatever so who knows yeah. they may translate it over to online it's quite possible and then you have like an online yeah. stream thing yeah they might i don't know Cause, i mean they did that they did that figure recent, it out they did that recently with babs con and it seemed to do okay so yeah but does but online streams do they make money uh, the, well, the streams, I, I don't know. <laughs> Are they exclusive to, like, people that bought tickets? Um, uh, I think they can make it that way. Uh, it seems like BabsCon, okay. it seems like BabsCon was, I mean, as far as I know, you could watch the videos, but if you wanted to participate or something, 
in panels or something they give you a stream key or something some kind of funky I, I can't remember I could be completely wrong but they, I do know that there were certain things that they made like exclusive and then they uh, but then they also had the online marketplace so they were just trying to like promote the vendors that were originally going to be there um, trying to promote the, them to sell their stuff Womp womp. Oh, yeah, I don't know. So I guess we'll just see what happens. So both of my... I had two cons scheduled um, before things kind of went to crap, and they both scheduled for September. So we'll just see if they end up still happening or, or not. We're all just going to die, and I'm going to be at my parents' house until, like, a year from now, and I really don't like being here extendably, except doggos are nice. <laughs> so, anyway. So I guess let's get to... Um, that's all the animation news. If you skip till this point if you're watching this from like in the future and like the future future where all this news isn't relevant this is the part where we'll start talking about the relevant stuff not that you would know that because if you skipped you wouldn't know but i'm just being repetitive so anyway so we're talking today about art stuff so art principles just basic stuff to get you started doing art or if you don't know where to start i'm recommending programs um i'm more of a traditional artist that um does stuff traditionally, which is a very bad habit of mine. Like, um, but that being said, I have maybe over a hundred hours doing life drawing um, between school and um, I take classes at the Animation Guild. I highly recommend if you're in um, SoCal. Uh, it's great. It's cheap, and it's taught by the best of the best. Um, so I did that, and then um, I most of the time I'm vending at conventions. I'm doing traditional commissions of pretty much any character that people want me to draw. Um, I do a lot of little girls as ponies, but then I've done things, weird things, like like I did the plant monster thing from Stranger, thing one, Stranger Things once. You um, mean the, de drawn the Demogorgon? Yeah, whatever that is. Have you, um, have so you, have done you that. sat down and watched Stranger Things? No. You probably should. <laughs> I'll get to it. You watch she I'll watch Stranger Things. You're, liter you're um, literally in Georgia where they filmed Stranger Things. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but there's a lot of things filmed here. Filmed here. But anyway, um, so there's... What else have I done? I've done a lot of she characters for some reason. Um, a lot of people cosplay as she characters. So they want the, co the characters they're cosplaying as. Um... I did, my favorite one that I've done for a while is someone wanted, I think they originally wanted a Catro, but they came back and they're like, I want Scorpia. And I'm like, I will draw you a good Scorpia. So I drew like a headshot of Scorpia and, and then it's just like, oh, you commissioned me. Like, oh, shucks. And she's like, she's like glad someone loves her enough to commission her. And it's such a cute drawing. And um, the lady who commissioned it actually got framed and tweeted at me. And she's like, this is the best drawing ever. Thanks again. Aww. I'm just like, thank you for your money. <laughs> but I'm glad, you, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you're enjoying the art. Because, you know, commissions, um, I, I use just traditional, like, computer paper. And I put it in a uh, page protector like a professional. So I'm always afraid that someone's going to, like, leave the commission in the car or something. Like, there's very few people that find me again and say hey I got the thing frame that you did so that and there was another one where I did a little girl as a pony and the parents were like we got her frame thanks so much like her cutie mark was the stuffed animal she had Lauren <laughs> it's so cute and it's it, it makes me sad because all the ones that I think are bad like I'm not particularly proud of that little girl with her cutie mark but you know it got framed so I'm like okay hey they so, <laughs> hey they liked it enough you know that they'll frame it so you know art, art yeah. you know it, you got to remember that art is subjective so as much as we can look at even our own stuff and see all the all the problems that are in it and we're like oh I should have fixed this I should have done that meanwhile somebody else is looking at it with fresh eyes like I love it so yeah if I drew if I draw one more baby Yoda again, I swear like, I want <laughs> How to... many baby Yodas have you drawn? I've done three and I and I've <laughs> three I've too drawn, many. I've drawn three <laughs> and it that was only after one con where where the Mandalorian came out of. So, you know, that's I'm just just I actually I have a the painting done of Baby Yoda that I'm going to sell at my next convention wherever that will happen because I know, like, what's a character that I can draw that probably will still be relevant in, like, six months from now or a year from now? It's like, Baby Yoda. So I have a Baby Yoda, like, looking at the stars and he's cute and stuff. But anyway, 
So um, I guess I'll start with my traditional art skills, and this will break it down to basics, um, defining some, some stuff for you, telling you places to look, um, and then Lauren will jump in and give you um, more advanced steps for digital art, which I recommend if your kid is an artist, get them in digital art. Don't, don't be like my parents who waited until like, I was 25 and then we're like, oh, here's, here's your tablet. I'm just like, oh my God, I hate this. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to, so the first step, I guess, is, you know, obviously draw. It doesn't really matter what you're drawing on. Um, as long as you continually draw to find, to, to not only draw, you can draw your favorite characters. I always recommend that you, people use their fandom love as inspiration to draw things. Like, I feel like. That's a great source of, you know, cr a creative push. And I don't think I would have had as big of a creative push to do what I do without, you know, the love for all the fandoms I have. Um, so, yeah, draw she draw my draw a pony, draw a discord, whatever you want to draw. Um, so step one, start drawing, you know. <laughs> and plus, plus, it doesn't it doesn't mean that fan art won't get you a job down the line. It got me jobs. So, <laughs> Yeah, don't listen to all the art teachers that are like, oh, fandom is, is dumb, draw original stuff. No, the, like, that's how people discover you is they, they, they discover, like, they're not going to be searching for, like, Joey Bob art. They're going to be searching for, like, their favorite character, like, again, She-Ra or Poison Ivy. And they're just like, I like the way this Poison Ivy is depicted. So that's the other step is, you know, finding your style i guess which is easier said than done mm -hmm. um that just about experimenting with art and kind of finding the way you prefer to draw your shapes and draw your characters um my style is very influenced by kim possible imagine that so like even when i'm just drawing freehand or i'm drawing um people from conventions people will come back it's like oh it's kim possible style and i'm just like sure you know whatever makes you happy so um <laughs> But don't worry about the style. The style will come. Um, so, and then draw from life. So that's just getting into the life drawing stuff. So let me define life drawing. So life drawing is basically, um, well, it is drawing from life, but it's more specifically drawing people realistically, which, um, or just kind of getting the general shape, the general position of the person to to display, you know, a sense of life, um, 3d ism i guess to the figure so a lot of people especially a lot of people that like animation kind of go backwards where they draw their favorite thing and then they draw like start drawing people after that but i think a good mix of drawing people and your favorite thing will help you because you really need that realistic kind of background to draw proportions correctly so proportions are you know based you know what a character is made up of um, they're made up of heads, essentially, so you measure the character by, like, they're this head's call or whatever, and, um, you know, that's how you figure that out, I guess. But, like, having realistic proportions or have proportions that are aesthetically pleasing, like, the first thing that I will notice, and probably Lauren will notice, too, is that if your proportions are off in a character, whether it's stylized or not. So, you know, and that kind of shows your amateurism thing, so, you know again start drawing r real people there's tons of youtube videos that are playlists of just life drawing um playlists essentially you can choose clothe or not clothe so not clothe is the whole traditional like drawing people naked um that's you know that's not it's not preferred at all it's just studying it's like a doctor studying the human body it's artists um seeing how like bones and muscle in the body influence each other you know things like lighting and shading of how the light is reflected on the model and seeing you know how it affects the shadows lighting is a whole another thing mm -hmm. um but yeah so it's don't don't feel embarrassed about going to life drawing classes no one cares the model doesn't care and the model um, is i mean the model cares a little but the model is not going <laughs> but, to jump at you while they're naked that's it's just, i remember people were just when i when I, it was not my first figure drawing class or life drawing class, but it, for other people in the class, it was back in college. I think it was my freshman, freshman year. And I do remember everybody kind of like pinning themselves against the wall outside the classroom. They can like, I'm like, are you guys nervous? They're like, uh-huh. I'm like, 
guys, the model is not going to... I told them this exactly what I'm telling you now. The model is not going to jump at you when they're not clothed or anything like that. They... There is. But wouldn't that be a great joke? <laughs> Define how. <laughs> just like the saying like, oh, they're not going to jump at you. And then just sneak behind, sneak over to the model and go, hey, can you just jump? They, they have like just, little vampire teeth can you just like, Can something? you just like psych them out for two seconds? <laughs> but no, it's like. It's, Ew, naked people. Yeah, but no, it's the, yeah, with, with, yeah, with life drawing and figure drawing, super essential. Um, but don't, don't be afraid to take a class. I mean, everybody is in the same boat as you are when you're in one of those classes. And at this point in quarantine, the best bet you're going to have is by doing studies based from photos or from videos. Videos are probably more preferable because if you can see how the figure is in real time moving around and rotating, you can see it from a three dimensional perspective. So anyway, that's my two cents. Anyway, um, so if you just Google, like, time life drawing on YouTube or time gesture drawing. So a gesture drawing is, like, essentially the model has a specific pose. And those are, ten like, those are faster tentatively than just drawing a huge, like, Mona Lisa style. It's basically so you can catch the, um, the movement of the character. So the character, like, looks like it has a personality depending on the pose and what they're doing. Um very important for animation so and then that's where the line of action comes in so the line of action is basically just a line that depicts how the, like usually in the middle of the of the character or model or whatever that when you draw depicting how the like following usually the spine as far as what way the model is pointing or you know so line of action you know mm-hmm. it's the action of of the character so um those are some basic stuff and then as far as other traditional media mediums um i like drawing in charcoal sometimes even though that's messy as as all heck so um if you're interested it, it's a lot smoother than drawing as on paper and a lot of people in life drawing classes with the huge like 18 by 24 big canvases they have um they draw in charcoal um, if you want to reduce the mess a little bit then you can get charcoal pencils and then you just hold it So when you're holding the pencil, you're not holding it traditionally like when you're typing with your fingers. So you're holding the thumb on top of the the tip of the pencil and then your whole hand on like circling the bottom and you get used to it. But that's basically to help you kind of start using your arm to draw because you don't want to use your wrist to draw as much because it limits um, it limits you a little bit as well as your lines are going to be a lot smoother if you kind of start getting in the habit of drawing you know, with your arm and not doing too many strokes, essentially, which is, again, something that I have to personally work on because I draw, like, tons of lines and it makes everything more complicated. Um, Let's see what other traditional mediums that I do. Um, And you want to tell them about the knead eraser, Lauren? Oh, yeah. So knead erasers are pretty much, like, the knead eraser is, like, it's kneaded clay, basically what it is. It's almost like a putty. And often... Uh, traditional artists that go into uh, into a studio and will use it with uh, with uh, graphite and charcoal and stuff, they have a kneaded eraser because it picks the pigment off the page a lot more easily than a rubber eraser that may end up grinding it deeper into the into the page. You don't want that. So a kneaded eraser helps kind of lift that pigment off by using its like that sticky consistency. Um, and it, and it also, it can last you quite a while. Um, but yeah, and it can be rolled into a ball and you can roll it across the page and, and just pick it up that way. But yeah, kneaded eraser, that's definitely one of those things that they will, no matter how many life drawing classes or studio classes, they'll tell you, even if you're taking a painting class, just in case, have a kneaded eraser. <laughs> so kneaded erasers, um, and then painting i guess we'll move on we'll touch base on painting a little bit before we move on to digital fancy fancy stuff Mm -hmm. um so how i paint is i do a very rough sketch of what i want to paint in on the canvas um usually with a blue blue pencil or something like that photo blue by Um, the way it's like sometimes that's that's there's actually a light color called photo blue and then you can find a pencil for that if you go to an art store um, it's actually to draft out things very lightly. So you have just enough 
of a hue that you can see what you're doing on the page. But let's say you want you don't want it to show up on a scan or anything like that if you're going to go over with ink. If you take a picture of it and bring up the contrast, that blue won't show up. So it's really good for drafting. Anyway, continue. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of comic book artists who do still do comic book traditionally use um, the blue to do their pieces, and a lot of animators still use blue pencils to do their their rough sketches and they outline them with pencil. But anyway, so, um, and then I draw my figure and then basically I layer the paints. So it's a little hard because you, like, once you, it's basically coloring essentially, except you're, it's, it's, you're a little bit more, um, what's the word? You're, you're. It, it depends on the, it, the order is more important than just coloring. So usually you do the backdrop first and then you drew, draw like, you paint, you paint the color of the, the, the subject, like the skin tone, and then you do like the hair over that. And that's just to make sure that if you make a mistake, so like say I'm making, I, we have a blue background with a, with a headshot of a person. So if I do the blue background and I bleed a little bit into the space of the person, then it's not that big of a deal because I'll just paint over it when I paint like the, sh- the details of the shirt or the, the neck or whatever. Um, the only thing that's kind of hard sometimes with painting, if you are painting in that way, is that you, you kind of have to remember the details. Like once you paint in the person, if it's a person, for instance, you kind of have to still like paint it light enough that you can still see like the, the outline of the nose and the, and, the, um, and the eyes. And the other thing is like when you make a mistake when you're painting, it's hard to like fix it Um, yeah Um, watercolor is often not as forgiving acrylic can be a little bit more forgiving like anything that you can kind of more or less wipe off really fast as soon as you make the mistake um i think i think acetone also works i i could be wrong on that but yeah it's just most often it's painting over your mistakes as best as you can if you do (laughs) <laughs> so it's not like it's not like drawing digitally where you can just press the undo button oh my god it's, it's the worst so <laughs> when you can't where's the where's the undo button i keep on pressing my paintbrush on the canvas and nothing is happening <laughs> so that's a procreate uh joke we'll get to that in a second but anyway um so you know that's how i you know painting is kind of um we can't, like sometimes i'll do it because People usually, when they're commissioning things at conventions, they want something specific. They want their daughter. They want their dog. They want something that you can't plan for. So usually what I'm doing is a piece, like, pre-done to to sell at a con. To I usually do, like, a silent auction thingy, Bob. Um, it will be something that's relatively safe. So, like, for the, the My Little Pony conventions, I do a character that the voice actor is there for. So I have I usually do Discord when John is there, or I'll pick, I've done Fluttershy before when Andrea Lindman is there, or this year for BernieCon, I did Discord and I did a Fosticorn, which is um, the creator Lawrence Faust's Pony OC. If you're confused, don't worry about it. <laughs> I did Pony of someone that was gonna be there, their pony character, whatever. And um, so I can get them signed and then it can be like, detailed thing of of this this pony signed by the person who makes the voice sounds of the pony so <laughs> people usually get excited about that um i did a luna a princess luna one year that was signed by tapitha so you know stuff like that so anyway um i think that's all my traditional tips um get a sketch pad with paper that's relatively thick um, or at least have a lot of paper that you can you can lean on. So usually um, when I'm at conventions, I have a cardboard, just like a little piece of cardboard that I put under the paper so the paper doesn't bleed through when I start using markers to color it. Um, you know, but you can buy sketchbooks pretty cheap these days. You know, go to the store, get a sketch pad. The, the very, the bare basics, like the computer paper, all of that stuff is very relatively easy to find Mm -hmm. um so once we so after lauren talks about the online tools we'll trail back and and talk about um animating traditionally which both me and lauren have done in the past yay i'm talented so um in my animation class or or both my animation classes we used computer paper we didn't use anything particularly special but um the complicated part comes when you get the light box and you can, and you put and you have to clip your paper specifically to the pegs of the animation table. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, Lauren, tell me how do I use Photoshop? <laughs> okay, well, first off, yeah, I'm gonna start off with the the, the general programs that you may. It, most of them are going to be yes, a forewarning. They're mostly going to be um, Adobe Creative Cloud or Creative Suite. 
uh, programs, but only to use these as not strictly this is what you have to use, but they are a foundation of what you can look for in a program if you don't want to go with these programs. There are always substitutes. Um, with, for instance, to I'm going to give you the most you know, the most general one that everybody pretty much knows is Photoshop. Originally started as a photo editing program, but then everybody went crazy with the digital art on there. So it basically became incredibly versatile. Uh, it's it as long as you have a digital tablet i mean there's a lot of artists that even use just their mouse to draw in photoshop and create art and god bless them yeah but <laughs> but if you are definitely 100 percent more comfortable with a tablet definitely look into there's all sorts of tablets out there uh monoprice actually offers pretty pretty reasonably priced ones that was one of the first ones i got a oh, wacom uh, a Wacom was my first one, but it was a very, very, very small Wacom. Uh, then I invested in my own Monoprice, and now I have I run off an iPad, but <laughs> but I also have a Cintiq as yeah. I also have a Cintiq as well uh, from a friend. I'll just give you I'll just add a, a, a tip. So if you're if you're used to drawing traditionally, or it's very hard for you to dr- to use a tablet. So how the tablet is basically set up is that you have a little pad that you draw on. But for most most of the time, when you're used to drawing traditionally, you have the you're having to look up at the screen of, to see the drawing versus like looking down and seeing as you draw. So the iPad is probably the best bet if you want if you're mostly a traditional artist and you're getting used to creative like getting used to doing stuff creatively like digitally. Um, you get the iPad and you get the iPad Pen and you get Procreate, which is like ten bucks, and you're and you're set. Mm-hmm. You know, which is basically pho- Pro- Procreate is basically an artist um, friendly version of Photoshop for your iPad. So, but anyway, if you're if you're not ready to buy an iPad yet, or you're like, well, I don't really care, I can draw wherever I want, then you can go get a tablet like a Wacom or the one Lauren's suggesting. Okay, Lauren, continue. Yeah. So um, with Photoshop. I mean, that's the most general one everybody kind of knows, uh, but it is a, you know, it's a now one of the most popular digital drawing programs that people use in for all digital artists, all sorts. Um, but it, it, because they can buy and download all sorts of either free or custom made brushes that you can buy as a set that all these artists from all over the world have made. Uh, basically to make any, any image and any, add any effect you want to a picture. Um, but with, uh, but it does come as part of the creative cloud suite, which is, uh, basically a whole bucket of, (laughs) of, of Adobe products. And I currently do have the creative suite, you know, the whole create, I call it the creative suite. That was originally what they called it, but it's the creative cloud, um, that you can, you know, pay per month for an amount of programs, one of them being Photoshop, or you can pay per, for like one program and still do that per month if you want to, or do an annual plan, however you want to do it. They, they try to be flexible on the, uh, on the plans. Uh, so, uh, but then if you don't want to get Photoshop, I will say that there, of course, are other alternatives, and some of those are, a lot of them actually are more like open source and free to use, or they are very, very, very inexpensive uh, compared to Photoshop, which, yeah, it's not exa- not exactly cheap to even just have on its own. It's sometimes cheaper to just have it as part of your cloud. Um, but it's, uh, but there are some examples like uh, Fire Alpaca. You can use uh, that program. That is one you can free, free download for, for Mac or PC. They have both versions and they're constantly updating the program and so if you need to update it'll probably shoot you a little alert saying you should probably download the new version just in case because it's got these bug fixes and stuff um and it's really good too because people have made brushes for that for that program as well that are also free so it's free on top of free and i've used it especially for inking it's a really great program for inking if you're uh if you're they even have layouts for comic pages so it's almost like they're trying to do what um i think there is a um was it clip studio paint is i'm I'm trying to remember Mm -hmm. if that's the one that there's also like manga studio and all these other ones that are like that are like a comic book creator friendly and so uh okay yeah (laughs) you're saying 
I was going to say, define the order, like, define inking in what order you would, like, do the picture in. Okay, so when it comes to, yeah, when it comes to that, you first have to sketch out. Sketch out what you want. It's kind of like taking the foundations of traditional, and you go forward with them in digital. Uh, in pretty much any digital art program, you work in layers. So don't lose track of those layers, by the way. I, I Just make sure if you're going to use a bunch of layers, name them. <laughs> You don't want to lose track of that stuff. So make sure you have on one layer your sketch. Or sometimes you may have a cluster of sketch layers in case you need to separate like foreground, middle ground, background. Lay out what you want. Usually prefer to use a sketchier brush, like something that alludes to pencil or just uh, using a lighter color to draft out what you want. Uh, next, next few layers up, uh, you start doing... Uh, for me, I've been doing inking because you know what you can do after that is when you have everything inked in, uh, you can do color layers underneath the ink layers. It's almost like having, you know, if you, uh, if you want to basically select that layer and you fill in underneath it. So that way it's not like you have to paint over the, over the ink layers. You just arrange them underneath. Um, I know it's like, I think with, with Procreate, which we'll get into in a sec, they make that more intuitive and more friendly and much more easy to use, but uh, we'll get to that in a sec. Um, and then finally, you can use filters. You can use uh, filter layers or anything that... Uh, you, you can just basically adjust anything in the layers of Photoshop. Uh, if you want to add clouds, if you want to add light, if you want to add shading, uh, those can all be their own layers. And it can be multiples of layers, so it depends on how detailed your picture is going to be. But you can adjust them however you want with uh, different uh, layer effects and stuff like that. So there's all sorts of tools. It'd be ta it would probably take a million hours to describe how Photoshop works to all of those degrees. Um, That's like a whole, <laughs> a whole episode on its own. Yeah, just, just to talk about all the different functions of Photoshop would be an episode and a half. Um, but... But it basically, it, it's not hard to, to arrange and, and construct a file in Photoshop as long as you have a sketch layer, an ink layer, a color layer, and some effects layers like lighting and shading. And if you want to have a background there too, then you obviously put that, you follow that order. You put it underneath uh, your other layers like your ink and color. So um, yeah, it's, it's, that's pretty much the foundation, foundational stuff for Photoshop. And the same can apply to if you're making images in Illustrator, another Adobe program that's vector-based. Uh, if you're not familiar with working with vectors, vectors are not pixels. They, uh, they are much cleaner, much more, uh, they're, I want to say they're much more adjustable because often when you're working with vectors, you're working with points versus pixels. Uh, so you can make a, make a stroke in, like a brush stroke in Illustrator and you can adjust that more easily because often there are points that you can use to move move the uh, stroke however you want it and curve it and smooth it and flatten it and anything you want with it. Um, it is still kind of complicated to work in if you are just getting started in vector work, uh, but it's but it becomes you know it becomes second knowledge, second knowledge when you uh, start getting into it again. Uh, just, you know, practicing on it. Just like with anything. Yeah, vectors are hard. I have flashbacks to high school when we were vectoring stuff in Illustrator for t-shirts, and I was just like, I don't like, I don't, do not like. But <laughs> yeah, basically the big difference is um, vectors are for things that need to be, ex like, made bigger. Like, think signs, think a lot of graphic design work, think posters, mm -hmm. think t-shirts, like I said. Um, well, you know, Photoshop or pixel-based programs are just for art. But usually a good workaround is if you know how big your size are, the size of the image you want, and um, you do not know how to vector things, you just make the, the, the dimensions of the original image really, really big. Uh, that's a lot of times what we do on the team is we'll make for backgrounds and things like that, that animation is going to go on and instead of making it like 1920 by 1080, which is the YouTube dimension size of things, we make it twice that length or that, that size, which... I don't know what the math is, but it's like whatever twice that length is. And that way, um, it still looks good on a YouTube video. And if you we have to zoom in for a particular shot, uh, 
it's storyboarded, so we usually know if we have to zoom in. It's not gonna like, you know, we the the picture is big enough that if we zoom in specifically, that it won't look too bad unless we're like zooming in really really thick, or really really <laughs> like there. But um, vectors, you don't have that problem. You can zoom in as much as you want if that's your hobby, I guess. <laughs> and that's why people like it for signs and posters, and that's why all the logos for our stuff is made in. Illustrator because we don't know what we're going to need it for. We don't know if we're going to put the logo on a t-shirt. We don't know if we're, it's going to be on a banner for YouTube. Mm-hmm. So it's better to have it a vector if you if you don't know. But if you do know what you're making the art for and you don't want a vector, you can just make this, the dimensions. Start start the picture with dimensions twice the size and then um, you should be set. So. Yeah, and, uh, and with it also being vector-based, you can also build puppet pieces. Like if you know about puppet animation, uh, That's basically where you take elements, you parent them to each other like you would building a skeleton. Like the head bone's connected to the neck bone, the neck bone's connected to the chest bone. (laughs) Now I know it's not chest bone, but you know what I'm talking about. It's going with the rhyme. But it's basically when you can parent, uh, which is a term to just say connect pieces together, uh, uh, all of these pieces into a puppet that you can animate uh, in various programs, that being like... uh, uh, photo uh, like you, well Photoshop yes but with uh, Flash slash Animate or you can do it in After Effects uh, or any other program like that um, but yeah it's it's because you can build those puppets in in vectors you can adjust them more easily than having to go into Photoshop uh, and having to possibly redraw things uh, if you didn't if you it's a much more easy to duplicate and copy elements in Illustrator than it is in Photoshop and to have it be clean all the way through without losing any resolution on whatever you're editing. So that's another thing because of Photoshop being pixel based, make your images bigger (laughs) than what you're expecting them to be usually. It's uh, because of that them not being vector based. If you were to try and resize them, you may lose that image quality. If you say had a small image, and you grew it bigger. Now, you're going to lose all of that detail that you worked on because you work too small. Work bigger, and then you can always shrink down the image if you need to, or make a duplicate and shrink that version. Always save your work. That's another thing. Always save your work. Even if you need to save it every five minutes and hit that command S, just do it. <laughs> yeah, your, your, your future self will thank you, but... Um, yeah, we're, we're kind of in, like, level two, level three, like, digital stuff, so, um, you know, I, like, as you're practicing do, doing digital stuff, you can always do characters without a background, with just a transparent background, mm-hmm. and how you do that is the, like, la- there's just no layer under the, the background, that's a lot it's of, just transparent. That's a lot of artists that do just straight-up character portraits without a background, and honestly, since my own strength is not in backgrounds, um, even at this point, I'm considering with, uh, doing commissions going forward is just doing a character because that's my strength anyway it's just if i if i mean i only if i'm really really bold and i want to try doing a background for somebody i'll do it not like i can't do it it's just it's not my wheelhouse (laughs) yeah most people were like i want to draw the character and i'm just like yes but i need this background they're like but character (laughs) and i'm like learn how to animate so um that's just a general artist thing is people it's funner to draw characters it's funner to draw people than the background um you know unless you really like still life then you're probably going to want to draw the character but just kind of practice in both in case you know you never know what you're going to be needed for and boring stuff and if you're going to be a storyboard so, um, if you're going to be a storyboard artist at the very least know how to lay out a scene even if you don't draw the full detail of every background just at least know how to lay out a scene because that's what i have to do even in a, it, even if it's not as clean, I do have to lay out backgrounds and seeing where characters are in a shot. So do know that as a storyboard artist, even though I'm not a professional storyboard artist, I am more of like a, I do I do it freelance. But yeah, <laughs> she does it when I ask her to. It hasn't <laughs> happened yet, but anyway, so. Um, Lauren's technically on the team, I guess, for those who don't know. Sometimes if I'm, if I need an animator for something, I'm just like, hey, Lauren, would you mind? And she's like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, when will it be done? I'm like, don't worry about it. It will be done eventually. And I'm like, yeah. So I'll get these random texts from Lauren saying, hey, it's almost done. And I'm like, Lauren, I believe you. Don't worry. 
It's like I just like to I just like to keep you posted just to make sure it's just like you know it's getting done it's getting done you see progress it's getting done. I promise I'm not procrastinating my homework, mom. <laughs> anyway, um, so let's touch on storyboarding and what is storyboarding, and um, that will probably bleed into um, 2D animation. Some basics for 2D I, animation. Well, I, we don't well, have I was going to cover. I was going to say Go uh, really quick. Uh, procreate. Let me just quickly go into Procreate because this is an incredible program. I'm going to not, I'm not a sponsor, sponsored person by Procreate or anything. I'm literally just going to sing the praises because it is that good. Procreate is only 10 bucks. Get it for your iPad or even the portable version for your iPhone if you have that. I think even Android has it. Um, it's like, it, it's, it's so versatile in what it has, even though it's not a million bajillion tools like Photoshop, it gives you what you need as a digital artist. Um, and people make Procreate brushes and kits and all of that stuff that you can also buy that are also not expensive. Or you can even download free ones because it's like, it's that awesome. Uh, definitely, highly, de definitely highly recommend it. Uh, I use it every single day uh, for my work and for my freelance and for everything else. Um, it's just, it's just that easy and it's taking everything that you, uh, if you wanted to learn Photoshop, but you didn't want all of the tools to like overwhelm you, I recommend trying out Procreate first or even something like Fire Alpaca where it's not a million bajillion tools, but it is what you need as a digital artist. So I'm just going to leave that there and it's, yeah, it's super, super easy to get. Uh, and, uh, I just think, I think the only thing is. Uh, people are hoping for like a desktop version of it, <laughs> which I totally get. But then that means that they would be definitely competing with Photoshop on all grounds. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Procreate. I mean, I'm someone who doesn't. I mean, I what I do on the team is I outsource all the tr the creative things. So I'm still kind of the creative lead, but um, I'm the primary goal is script writing for me because I'm the only one who can do that, and especially recording. That's the only one that that's Especially the only thing I can do. I don't think we'll we'll get an AI where we have automatic KP doing the, the voiceover for the video. So, like, I try to outsource things. So I can limit myself to stuff that only I can do so the videos can get done faster but don't lose um, quality. Because we, we try to have a really good quality um, in the in the KP videos. Um, I th I'm very proud of my KP videos. And, and I'm very proud of the podcast. And we get all these fancy assets and, like... 20 people watch us sometimes on YouTube because we forget to upload stuff on YouTube, which is go us. But anyway, <laughs> um, Procreate makes, is, is nice. Um, like it, it makes life so much easier. Like Photoshop, like for example, coloring in Photoshop is such a pain. You have to like, I don't even, I don't, I, I've been taught how you color in Photoshop, but I forgot. So it's like, you have to like put the, check the layer and, and like reverse inverse something. But Procreate, you just drag the color and put it on where you want it, and then it colors it. And I'm just like, yeah. where have you been all my life, my love? And then, and then the 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 undo button is you just hit the screen twice, yeah, and you, then does stuff. Yeah, you, and it's you pretty like, much just double tap. I think it, you double tap with two fingers to undo. So it's like it makes it so much easier. Oh, and uh, using a drawing layer as a reference for filling with color. Yes, that's what she's ref referring to, by the way, is um, let's say you have an ink layer, like you've made this awesome picture, you inked it, and so you have your ink layer. You, set, you go to your ink layer settings, label it as reference. You'll see there's a little thing that says reference, hit that, go check it off. And so when you make another layer underneath it to be your color layer, you can just drop in the color you want from the palette, drag it down, and fill it and it does does it super clean too and you can adjust the spread of the fill so that way if you're seeing like oh it's mixing missing a couple pixels here and there you just take the color and you drop it in press and hold and then you drag it and a new little like scale uh, a little monitor comes up where it shows you the scale of the of the spread of the fill so you can control how much goes out in feathers versus you know Photoshop, which you have to sometimes 
adjust the tolerance and all this and that and then you just have to keep tapping that fill <laughs> until it's just like spread enough that you like it and even then it's not always clean so <laughs> it's all hell procreate our lord and savior yes <laughs> And also, okay. and also, they have a, a a new animation feature in Procreate, which they're trying to test it out to see how people like it. Uh, it. But that does segue into our next topic, which I will bring up another program when we get into it. Okay, so um, as people, as as you will find out, you don't need a fancy program to animate. You just need usually pencil and paper, and you can like pe- you know that's how people used to do it, right? So if you're just starting to animate then, um, and you don't know how to start, then that is um, option A. Um, the biggest thing, I think, is um, getting, what are the things called, Lauren? The, the pegs. So getting animation pegs yes. um, and getting hole punchers for the peg. So the peg is basically the thing that holds all your paper together because when you're animating, things have to be placed very specifically so only certain aspects of the character move. So if you're animating like a walk cycle or something and you have the arm swing, then only the arm should be moving. The rest of the body shouldn't be moving unless it's reacting to something. So um, also, if step you, number one, if, go ahead. Also, if you can find it, uh, I'm sure there's places online that even sell it, uh, animation paper, like literally just rungs of animation paper. It's not expensive to get them. And it's the foundation. It's already pre-hole punched stuff that's set to those that's already set to the the animation pegs like the spacing of them so you don't have to do it for every single page if you had like regular paper but just saying if you want to look into it there is animation paper and that is what animators have used for traditional animation and still use so uh yeah just just saying (laughs) save yourself a lot of grief on punching trying to three hole punch a whole bunch of things all at the same time yeah, but if you don't if you don't mind hole punching and you don't want to buy animation paper because the internet is hard, then you can always just use computer paper. Like I like I was saying earlier, like both my animation classes, we just use computer paper because when you're animating, you go through a lot of paper. So sometimes just it's easier just to to use computer paper as just like, well, if I run out, I can just go to the store. I don't have to like go online and like order it and wait until shipping and stuff. So I think there's two kind of pegs. I don't know what they're called. They're, I think there's one's called an acne peg. And basically it's just the middle, like whether it's like thicker or not, it doesn't really matter which one you use as long as you're consistent. Mm-hmm. So whatever. And then um, the next step is basically looking at your animation principles so there's 10 animation principles that i totally know off the top of my head but you can find videos where they break down um what the animation principles are but just just know them before you start i think it will save you a lot of grief if you just are going in blind and you're just trying to have to learn these things people people figured it out for you for a reason yeah Um, if you're really serious learn by watching others basically observe observe movement observe other artists observe nature observe how things move observe physics i'm not talking about the numbers i'm not talking about the formulas i'm just talking about literally watch a ball drop and see how it hits the floor (laughs) i mean you gotta understand that so if if you're really if you're really interested in learning like the principles very thoroughly there's always the one book that everyone recommends that i will recommend for you right now it's uh richard williams animation survival guide it's thick um, Richard Williams was known, um, he just died like a year ago, but he was known for being very thorough with his animations and very nitpicky. He um, did Who Framed Roger Rabbit and the famed unfinished video film The Thief and the Cobbler because he couldn't get, he couldn't schedule things. But anyway, that's unimportant. So, um, but he's, he was, I think he, before he died, he was probably the best living animator, period. Mm-hmm. And then it's probably, now probably it's Glenn Keane or one of the, one of the, the Renaissance um, animators or, or something mm-hmm. but anyway um you can buy it um or you can you can get a physical copy or you can get one like a download of a pdf of it or whatever you can probably pirate it if I'm, i won't recommend pirating but it is it's it's out there to be pirated if you so choose um same thing with his lecture classes um which are uh, hecka expensive or you can go get them some other means which again i recommend if you want to sit through like 20 lecture classes of him breaking down animation principles but anyway um like from the 80s or whatever whenever um so 
Let's see. So I think the biggest, probably the biggest ones are squash and stretch, mm -hmm. which is basically knowing and like frame rate, which is how to animate in one podcast. So, um, just so squash and stretch is, yeah, it's, um, it's basically when an object moves, how, like, if it's like a ball, like Lawrence, like the, very, the most common animation practice test that I have ever heard that I've done like several times and Lauren's probably done it like a million times is the bouncing ball mm -hmm. um, animation test. So basically you're taking a ball and you're seeing like as it, as it hits, goes closer to hit the ground, there's more frames because the action is slowing down. And then as it gets back up, it hits the ground and you can see how it reacts with the ground. How long does it take to, you know, squash? Cause it's, you know, it's physics, it's hitting the ground and it's reacting to hitting the ground and then it bounces back up and then the frame rate or how many frames per individual um, shot or use essentially frame rate is hard. Anyway, um, it, it, it changes based on the distance of the object towards the, the, the thing it's, it's interacting with. So less frames when the action is faster, more frames when the action is slower. Mm -hmm. um, that, that helps with run cycles generally. When you get and um, so when you, you get more you, advanced, go into smears. <laughs> oh God, um, yeah, smears are like the Looney Tunes thing when it when you catch like it off something off frame and it's like all like blended together in lines and stuff like that. Maybe if there's a demand, we'll do like like intermediate animation um, tips for people that care about them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I think squash and stretch is the most important one. Um, keeping a solid line, which is make surely basically making sure when your character is moving in a frame that um, the line is like the line the outline is consistent so like say you have a foot the foot isn't changing sizes every time the character is moving it should be consistent um, you know boring stuff like that so I'd recommend doing the bouncing ball tests which you can find videos on everywhere if you'd like just to kind of get your feet wet as far as you know animation timing and that's usually what animators in the olden days are trying to perfect depending on a scene um, how the timing works for a character depending on what they're doing um, you know and then also if you're going to do traditional animation learn how to flip paper mm -hmm. please it will save you so much time because like the, the bad thing about tr animating traditionally is you, to test things you have to take pictures of each frame and play it back and if you are um so digitally you can do that instantly, but it's it's like a whole ten minute process just to check. So you know you want to try to flip to at least double check before hopefully save you some time. But the good thing about animation, unlike stop motion, is that if you fit, if you get if you mess up a frame or something like that, then you can just like add more later or something, whatever you need to do. Versus stop motion where you're just you're just screwed if you screw up. Anyway, um, um, I think that basics so um and then you can always storyboard your scene which um storyboard pro is a free program that i use sometimes if you need to story about a storyboard out of a specific scene please oh god storyboard your scene or do like a rough sketch of what's happening in each um shot or image like you know if a character is running like their hand is moving up and down and like maybe it's a it's a wider shot where the character is interacting with the house so learn camera like you know the, the kinds of shots that you're using learn um you know you don't have to storyboard tr you, digitally um lauren you have an example of that right yeah i was gonna say um there are animation professionals storyboard professionals who don't even have to well the, they will tell you like oh the, st the standard is now using storyboard pro but not everybody can obviously have that in, so easily at home so what they do is sometimes they just use Photoshop or Fire Alpaca or anything like that to just draw, just to draw frame by frame what they want, and they just turn them into JPEGs or PNGs, and then they just arrange them in in a movie maker of some sort and set it to sound, and that's how they do animatics. So I mean, basically you can still do that to a degree with you know with animation if you're if you're dedicated enough and you want to do that you can so um i mean there's always a workaround to everything uh but well, yeah with like storyboarding you can use those programs or you can hand draw them on with pencil and paper on sticky notes on little uh, storyboard sheets that you uh, if you haven't seen those there's a template for them and everything like you can even google one 
and use that as your as your base for for you basically thumbnail out what you want in a storyboard you write out the action and the dialogue that's happening in each of those frames uh and then you just string them together in an animatic because then you know what's going on for each scene or each shot um but yeah you can it, there's the traditional way there's the digital way and then there's just like yeah if you can't do storyboard pro which is definitely more advanced anyway uh but uh so if you can't do that then you obviously can use the other programs that we've mentioned before um yeah and some people even use procreate for their boards they i mean they just if there's a will there's a way <laughs> yeah um and some like just just depends but yeah i think the biggest thing is like why we're recommending all this stuff is just making sure you plan things out because you don't want to start animating and then like you realize oh this character this shot doesn't work oh it's not clear what this what's happening in the shot so um you don't want to have to like redo animation because the animation part takes a while mm -hmm. especially if you're doing like inking coloring you're doing the whole thing um if you're just starting out i would just do just do sketch or pencil tests just to kind of get used to animating and don't 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 do full color for things no. that you don't know how to do it. No, no, <laughs> please don't. It, and plus, it's just it's it's too much time and effort to 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 do that, especially if you don't know what you're doing. You don't wanna you don't wanna cause that much more stress for yourself. Start with the basics. Start with the fundamentals. Just do rough pe penciling. Just keep it light. Just keep it energetic, and just 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 get used to creating life. It's, you have to just get that's the most important part. Is if you can make somebody look at your work and believe it's alive, that is why animation has the effect of the illusion of life. So it's like as long as you have that, then you can build up from there. Don't try to make a Disney film when you have not even done a bouncing test. So don't uh, rip. do not rip you. <laughs> do not try to do that. I you know if you are ambitious and you have the drive, you just have to start at a proper place before you get to that point. Build up your experience. Do not try to overwhelm yourself trying to make, you know, something Disney or Pixar would make or DreamWorks would make or Warner Brothers would make you know, before you are ready to do that to the, to the full extent, you have to just, again, do it, keep it light, keep it rough and keep it, keep it simple. <laughs> okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, Tomb Boom, Lauren, and then I'll end out with yeah. some, some other tips. Yeah. It's funny because with Tomb Boom, it's not very easily accessible even to freelancers. Um, it, it hasn't been for a while, so I, I, I can't really say too much about it, except I know the interface. It's not as intuitive, as, at least to me, as, as somebody who has more experience working in Flash. Some people say, oh, it's kind of like working in Flash, but then some. And I'm like, it, it's yeah, it's, it's an option that's out there, and a lot more studios are trying to switch over to it. Um, but to this day, uh, Flash slash animate is one of those programs that is still industry standard for like tv animation and even some short film animation um but toon boom is on the rise if you if have seen anything like uh the lion guard or the tangled series or anything like that those are actually done in toon boom so they're much more sophisticated in design and in character rigging and in how much control you have over a scene um and so it, 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 that's how it was, that's why it was designed. It was to make that to make that whole process more sophisticated and more streamlined. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's something I still myself need a little bit more practice in. Um, but yeah, it's uh, but I mean to a degree, I see what people were saying when they're like, oh, it's kind of like Flash, but the 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 interface is not the same as Flash. So it take, it's a whole other learning curve to just learn Toon Boom. So if you want to learn Toon Boom, look up tutorials and, and see if that is the program for you to begin with. <laughs> so If you want to hurt yourself. It's like, otherwise, it's like, yeah, I mean, down the line, it, it, 
it should be something that more pe- people should be able to have access to. But for right now, yeah, it's, it's all a bunch. It, it's mostly studios and maybe freelance animators that have some uh, have a license to it. But um, but it's it's it, yeah, it's, it's it's just something that has to be practiced with first before it before I, I remember trying to use that for my senior thesis film before I even really knew what I was getting myself into with it so because somebody said oh do you want to do it in flash I'm like yeah they're like well why don't you try it in tune boom that's like flash I'm like ooh, that'd be cool and I go in there and I'm like I need a whole other class let me just learn Spanish in the meantime yeah (laughs) Yeah, just like (laughs) meanwhile I need a whole other class just to learn tune boom and at the time uh, there really wasn't a class for tune boom it was that new uh, we had it on the computers, but I didn't know how to use it. <laughs> so nowadays, there are actually tutorials and classes and lessons and all sorts on how to do Toon Boom. And there's Toon Boom Harmony. There's yeah, it was Toon Boom Basin again. Toon Boom Harmony or something like that. There's different versions of it. Um, but yeah, it's it's that kind of stuff where. You can build up to those, and, and in the meantime, if you can't have the program, it doesn't hurt to watch tutorials and see how it works so that you are familiar with how it works before you get into it yourself. Um, but yeah, and, and as more in studios are starting to use it, it'll be better to learn it, absolutely, and to know it, even if you aren't going to work in it. So yeah, uh, otherwise, there's always a way in other, in other, other tools. So, and there's always more materials at your disposal if you can't get a hold of Toon Boom. So, there's always a way. It's just like with, um, I was going to say, there is um, a more basic, it's, let's say you're starting in animation and you want to do it on the digital platform. Flash is number one. You know, if you want to learn how to animate in frame by frame and you're doing it in a vector base, there you go. Um, and a pretty understandable interface. Uh, with keyframes and dropping in audio and syncing your animation to audio, working on a workspace. Uh, it's, it's been around for forever. <laughs> and, um, some, and yeah, it's, it's to this day still used for TV animation. So, um, but with, when it comes to um, drawing frame by frame, something that's a little bit better would be either something like TV Paint Pro, which I did animate in, in college. Uh, that's a French program, and uh, there are a lot of short films I've seen, and even full film projects that have used TV Paint Pro, which is a lot more compatible if you want to make something look more hand drawn, and it is more something that if you wanted to do uh, onion skinning and do it with a pencil brush and make it look like it's you know pencil and paper drawing, uh, that program can do that for you. And then an even cheaper alternative to that, which I recently discovered and have been having a great time with it, um, is actually one where I, I'm hoping to find more brushes for it if I can. Um, but in the meantime, it's a great tool is Rough Animator. There is an app that it's only a few bucks. I'm not even kidding. I think it's only about four bucks or something like that. And it's uh, otherwise it's like you, you pay that once and you never have to pay for it again. And it's where you can also use the same kind of interface as Flash without, uh, without having to pay for the Adobe Suite. But you're also getting used to working to that th- through that interface without having to, you know, before you get into that program. Let's say you started with Rough Animator and then you go to Flash. Uh, the only thing is with Rough Animator, it is pixel-based, but it does have smoothing tools that are a lot like uh, Flash. So if, if you wanted a smoother line, more control, or if you wanted to have the computer to have more control over your line versus you, uh, you can do that in Rough Animator. And it uh, doesn't have, as far as I know, it doesn't have a frame limit in terms of how long you want to animate a scene for in Rough Animator. So I think that's pretty cool too. Is um, for And Rough Animator, by the way, is, as far as I know, just for iPad I think it is and maybe other tablets so like it's just pretty much a tablet in general kind of app uh, with flash it's desktop and all that stuff and you can do a lot with it as well 
Um, also, no frame limit as far as I know, unless you can take it to some crazy extreme level. <laughs> like, if you're going to have, like, I don't think, you can't animate a full movie in one file. Basically, you can't do that. <laughs> um, My dreams are dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, uh, there's always a way around everything when it comes to animation, when it comes to storyboarding. There, there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's, everybody has a method, and as long as it works, and as long as you get your story across... And as it's clear, uh, and that it, you know you can get people hooked onto it, that is what matters more in the end. Um, and uh, but in the meantime, if you want to learn more about these programs, there's tutorials and 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 classes, and n now there are classes <laughs> on on certain on certain programs that you can even take, or just books you can read, or even just again YouTube videos that you can watch. So. <sighs> to live in the internet era and grow up in that and see how much more kids know nowadays versus even just five years ago. So these damn kids you guys don't know how good you have it right now. <laughs> oh Lord. Okay. So anyway, um, ramble I'll over. end on a, <laughs> I'll end on um, some just notes as, as, as a producer and, or someone who kind of has a gist of what people are looking for at, on portfolios we can probably again have a whole episode about portfolio review because that's a whole thing mm -hmm. but a lot of times people will look for in your portfolio all this you know all these animation um, pieces depending on what kind of job you're applying for as well as um, life drawing like I've I've you know I never well I have I have applied for jobs but I've never gotten one but um you know, that's just what I hear a lot is people want to see that your life drawing skills are really like in place, you know what proportions are, those are the kind of things because when you're thrown into an environment where you're, you're not used to drawing these characters, then you kind of have to, like how, how easily can you ad adapt? And one of the things that I think people that are, you know, in the fan art bubble kind of predict or kind of used to is that, you know, their style might not be the style that's needed for the project. So when I try to find artists for my team, I look for people that are relatively adaptable or at least willing to be to be, you know, hey, this is something that outside your comfort zone. Is that OK versus someone who just wants to limit themselves? Because if you're limiting yourself, you're just kind of limiting your opportunities, essentially, which is, you know, up to you. Obviously, I can't tell you what to do. But, um, you know, that's just something to look for. Um, I also recommend um, for editing your stuff together. So there's um, Windows Movie Maker, there's iMovie, and then there's HitFilm um, Pro, I think, or just HitFilm in general. Google it. Mm -hmm. It's a free editing program. And um, it basically is, from what I've been described, it's um, Premiere and After Effects, uh, both Adobe projects, prod, prod, products. Both Adobe products, but they're combined, and it's free. Mm. So um, if you don't have a program, an editing program on your computer, then uh, feel free to look into that. Um, and then In Inkscape 2 is an alternative for, a free alternative for if you don't have Illustrator, if you re really want to. Mm -hmm. Again, Google Inkscape. Um, but I think the biggest thing is, like, knowing what um, people want to see because I've just, you know, I've been doing online content production on big scales for like five, yeah, six years now. God, God, we're old. But people, the, the big thing is that people want to see persistence and flexibility. Um, you know, I don't want to hire someone who only wants to, I say hire in air quotes, like it's all a volunteer, but I don't want to hire someone who only wants to limit themselves and only wants to do their one style. And um, because, you know, what if I don't need that one style? Mm -hmm. What if, um, you know, and as a, the creative process can be messy sometimes and there'll be a lot of revisions. I know as a producer and a content creator, I am very nitpicky, you know, so I am very nitpicky with what I want because um, of the, just the creative eye I want, just the creative eye I have, just because I know the art principles and sometimes artists I'm working on with don't have that foundation, which is fine. Um, but, you know, flexibility is always important as well. You know, like I might ask for like 5,000 revisions and I, you know, I know it's a lot and I know I'm a, I'm a butthole and stuff, but, you know, it's, it's kind of meeting halfway and realizing, oh, okay, like, they're not doing this to be mean to me. They're not doing this because it sucks. They're just doing this because they want the best and they want to push me to be the best. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, but I think the biggest thing when you're starting out is persistence and like getting that thing done. Because I think um, Laura and I have both been in the, the My Little Pony fandom for a while now, and there's just these big projects that just don't get done, man. And I get mad when there's panels for these projects that probably won't get done. And that's happened like like four or five <laughs> times where I'm just like, why are they having a panel for this thing that's been announced two years ago and we've seen, what, some pencil tests for it? Like, are you, like, you know, so, like, I pride myself in being able to have a team that, like, we finish we finish everything that we do and that is nice for people because they know they're they're not going to just do the work and it's just going to sit in the vault until I'm like oh never mind you know so like when you're when you are persistent when you finish stuff and you can put it at on your portfolio it shows versus someone who just like well I like you listen to this whole episode and you're just like I just want to do this thing and then you're like oh this is hard I'm bored and I'm no one's like you know and you don't have anything to show like no one's gonna like it it helps to, for when people to take you seriously as an artist as a creator as someone who's producing stuff when you finish your, your crap mm -hmm. um and when you have it like animation tests go a lot longer than just a still frame image of a character like you know it it, it shows just how much hour how many hours you put in it just shows like that you know that you're willing to self-teach yourself um you know because like just in the industry now you want to be surrounded by nice flexible people because you know people don't want to hire hire like buttholes like and those things travel around when someone's like oh he's a great person but he's a pain to work with then people will just like move on from your resume even if you're freaking amazing like i know the classic example is uh mick Kaw, who was a nine-year-old man he was a little salt salty and had an ego but he knew he would say things like i know walt's not gonna fire me because i'm the best living animator period and like i think he was right <laughs> so you know unless like you're so amazing that your attitude is tolerable that you're like then then you're you're not gonna get a job yeah. like you know, don't be a butthole. Um, Lauren, do you want to say anything? I mean, that's the fundamentals. Just it, it is be a nice person. Be decent to work with. Because uh, trust me, the industry is small. So the social circles are even smaller. <laughs> so it's uh, it's because of that, even on an international scale, is because the animators kind of stick together. So word gets around about, you know, other people. So it's just, it, that's just how it is. And so if people know that you're not being nice in the industry you're hurting your own chances of going to work anywhere else so that's kind of just just be a good person and be good with your work ethic but but even more more importantly just don't be a jerk <laughs> yeah and i think the biggest thing starting out when no one knows you is just be persistent and actually get your work done so you have something to show when you're asking people to look at your portfolio and ask like what can i improve upon you know, like I like I suck. I'm still cleaning up my deviant art from from pieces that like are like five years old. That I'm like, uh, I thought this was bad. Like the the best piece that I've done is like the only one. I'm just like, I still like that one. But everything else, I'm just like, I hate it. And my dad would like give me shade sometimes. He's like, Well, Rachel, your art needs some work. And I'm like, Thanks, Dad. I want to do this professionally. Thanks, Dad. But now, as a twenty twenty six year old. I've gotten to the point where my dad's like, oh, Rachel, your art's good. Do you still need to take art classes? And I'm like, wow, that I've, I, I've done it. Dun, 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 dun. So you still take art classes, obviously, to stay fresh and stuff. But like, um, so persistence, being a nice person in general and being flexible. Practice. And, um, also practice. Practice. Practice, yeah. practice, Again, practice. That comes with the persistence um, as well. So... I don't know like i guess if we if we have demand for this we'll do another like general animation breakdown or mm -hmm. like a more advanced breakdown on stuff or lauren will teach you how to do photoshop if you can't figure it out from the internet or you want me to be there and make funny jokes on the side <laughs> where we're just like yeah so um but i hope this this helped um and you know oh i i remember my, my thing that i was saying so about the fan projects thing mm. so um you know just like if you're going to start a whole fan project, again, this is a whole other podcast, is just, like, make sure your team is committed and um, 
yeah, I'll just I'll just save this this for another time. But you know, it's just it's it's frustrating when those things don't get done. And you know, oh, my other point, I remember it. I remember it is um be honest with the person you're working with. If you have any mental hi histories, if you have any physical conditions, if you have any limitations, if you have something that's coming up in your real life, because like producer, I mean, it depends on the person, I guess. But for the most like. I don't want to be a butthole and a lot of people don't want to be buttholes but we can't help you if you don't tell us that something is wrong if there's something coming up and that helps us tell the difference between whether you're procrastinating or whether you this thing is genuinely happening and you just need like you know my grandpa died I just need some time off and I'm just like didn't your grandpa die a week ago you know like but if like help us help you in making sure that you have a healthy work environment and when the producer is just not listening to you or the person in charge of the project is just like meh then um you might not be in the right place but um yeah i i, I think that's that's it lauren if i i've been a good producer i've been momming you pretty good right yep and so it's like that's why it's <laughs> like you, you yeah because you constantly check in with everybody making sure everybody's doing okay and it's like huh you we, there's been radio silence from so and so you know hope they're doing okay let's check in with them see how they're doing you know it's that's just how it is that's how it's been on the team and and that's good i mean it's a good healthy dynamic is to make sure that everybody's doing okay so that way you know the work is is doing well too um but because in mm -hmm. the end it, the person has to be okay in order for anything to happen you know so it's yeah, and sometimes we we do. like not to put you on the spot, but tell me tell me how great of a boss. <laughs> I yeah, I'm 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 just okay, but anyway, no, but um, it's been it's been good. Yeah. I can genuinely say this. It's like yeah. So I mean, and and KP's been really understanding of the whole thing, you know, for everybody if they if something's coming if something's come up, and as long as they're vocal about it, and then it's just like you know you know it helps them make sure that you know they can you know, that they can communicate with the rest of the team about if, if, you know, they're having trouble and they need somebody else to jump on something while they take care of something, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's, no, it's good. <laughs> my, my trauma motivates me to be vocal and demand people <laughs> to be more vocal. So it's great. So anyway, uh, I guess we'll end there. Lauren's like, this is going to be a shorter episode. And I'm like, no, it won't. <laughs> you just, just wait. Um, so if you're new, uh, please listen to our other podcasts episodes. Um, if you feel like it, that you can find them on YouTube and SoundCloud and Spotify and iTunes and wherever you get your podcasts. Cause I don't know where else you're getting them if they're not funneled through there somehow, yep. but they'll probably be there. And they upload, um, and we upload lazy, on Wednesday and they upload on Wednesdays. Yeah. They upload on Wednesdays at 6 a.m. Usually the YouTube version is on, on, um, at 4 p.m. on Wednesday if um, there isn't problems, but we don't try to really push it because I'm just like, if people really want to listen to it, they can just go on on SoundCloud and watch it. But anyway, um, you know, subscribe and put the thing. Subscribe to the main channel. That's part of the point of this. Um, hit that bell notification uh, button. Yeah, hit it. Smash it. Um, Punch that like button in the face um, like a boss. For just the like button. Give us your firstborn child, you know. Um, <laughs> join our our discord fan server we're trying i'm trying really hard um to make it um a place that you can get creative feedback and not just like chill and have game night and like talk about how cool i am um <laughs> that's a joke um i'm not you know so it which is it but anyway um if you feel like being social i am in the discord server a lot all the team members are in the server because um if you want to ask them questions about stuff um, but yeah, I wish you luck in your creative endeavor. Uh, listen to more episodes if you haven't caught up. I think we have like, like at least ten at this point um, to for you to binge, and you can always skip the news sections if it's boring and stuff. But yeah, thanks for listening to Animation Communication, yo. <laughs> Tune in next do time. Wanna, do you want to? <laughs> will we ever find the ghost of Old Man Jenkins? <laughs> Will Batman and Robin escape the Joker and Penguin? Find out next <laughs> week. Animation communications. Okay. Good night, Good everyone. Night. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to Animation Communication on YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider. 
we are really hoping this show makes a difference in how people view animation and media, as well as giving and providing advice for people all over the world who like or want to join the animation or media industry. If you liked what you heard, please remember to subscribe and rate those five stars, as well as tell your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to the main YouTube channel, I Love Kim Possible A Lot, and turn those notifications on. My name is Scribbler, and you have been listening to Animation Communication. Thank you.